Okay, as we were, welcome to the second installment of the history of the University of Cincinnati. If you were here last time, our exciting adventures concluded with the death of Charles McMicken and the actual founding of the university, and we're going to begin there and do just what this title slide suggests and cover 140 years of University of Cincinnati history in about 55 minutes. This is the, uh, uh, the actual condensed version of the history of the University of Cincinnati. And if you get whiplash, um, it is your responsibility because we announced this title last month. So we were forewarned. We're going to start with some decorations that appear around this uh, university and around the city of Cincinnati. The seals of the institution that indicate the date of 1870. Now occasionally people will call me up and say that they've seen one of these things with this 1870 date and want me to explain how we could have let this mistake uh, get past us. And in fact, there is no mistake. Um, and, in, and by looking at the various seals that you can find around the university and around the city of Cincinnati, you can determine when the seal was portrayed by the date that's listed on the bottom. From 1904 well into the 1930s, the official seal of the university showed this 1870 founding date. And from sometime in the 30s into the 40s, you would see two founding dates, 1819 and 1870. Most of the examples of this that I've seen are in yearbooks and, and annuals and that sort of thing. But the exclusive date of 1819 was not used on the official seal of the university until uh, late in the 1950s. So we'll, we'll get into that transition, but we're going to focus today on 1870, which is usually given as the founding date of the university uh, in these historic documents, and explain why that date is so important. So to do that, we have to go back to 1870 and look at the city of Cincinnati as it was at that time. Now, Cincinnati in 1870 was on the move. It was billing itself in promotional materials as the commercial capital of the state of Ohio. It uh, published uh, pictorial books to attract investors and residents to the city with statements that no other large city of the United States affords such a variety of position and scenery, including what appears to be a sincerely monumental Mount Adams. <laughs> In the 25 years before 1870, Cincinnati's population exploded um, from about 200,000 to over 300,000 in that year it was possible to get an education in the city. There were quite a few colleges of various sorts operating. Most of them had a medical or technical or religious uh, sort of aspect to them, but um, none of them was a university. And if you remember from last month, one of the great desires of the citizens of Cincinnati was to create their own municipal university. And so, as we discussed last month, that whole situation was made possible with the death of Charles McMicken. If you're a student at the university, an employee at the university, um, an alumnus of the university, at some point you come across the story of, of Charles McMicken how he died, how he left the bulk of his estate to the Cincinnati, city of Cincinnati to found two colleges for the education of white boys and girls using the Holy Bible 
of the Protestant version as contained in the Old and New Testament as a book of instruction. What few people hear is the legal brouhaha that followed the filing of McMicken's will. First, McMicken's heirs sued to get a larger uh, piece of the inheritance. Then the state of Louisiana sued because half of McMicken's property was located in that state and they did not want to give it to Cincinnati. And then the city brought in an army of, uh, of lawyers and McMicken's will finally landed in the United States Supreme Court, which ruled in the city of Cincinnati's favor. But still, a university was not founded. And partially this was because the city administration did not believe that after all this wrangling in which the city lost the Louisiana property, so we're dealing with half of the estate, they did not uh, believe that there was enough in the way of resources to found the sort of university that they had in mind. And most of this inheritance was not in the form of cash that they could go out and immediately spend. Most of the inheritance was in the form of rental properties that the city had to take over and maintain and collect rents from to get the money. And so, as we discussed last month, there were these efforts to kind of combine educational trusts uh, in the city to create a pool that was big enough to start uh, a university. And uh, when these plans were brought forth to combine the trusts, they very pointedly made sure to get only um, the, uh, the public and Protestant trusts and not the Catholic trusts. So, the whole thing might have just stopped there were it not for the intervention of one man who almost no one remembers today. And that's Cornelius G.W. Camagus. It was he who actually took the steps that created the University of Cincinnati, and it is a scandal that nowhere uh, on this institution is there any sort of monument or recognition to this man who almost single-handedly actually created uh, the University of Cincinnati. The GW in his name stands for George Washington. Uh, Cornelius GW Camagus was born in Delaware in 1816. Uh, his father, also Cornelius, served as governor of Delaware. One of his grandfathers, at least, was a soldier in the Revolutionary War. Cornelius came west to start a business in Indiana. Um, which failed. Uh, it was in Lawrenceburg and involved uh, grain shipments. He returned east to go back to medical school and he came back to Cincinnati in 1849 in the middle of a cholera epidemic where he built a very good reputation as a doctor and led a very secure existence in the city from that point on. He served on the city's Board of Education and there are very close ties at this time between the founding of the university and the board. He's recognized as one of the founders of Cincinnati's public library, but the key point is that in 1869, he ran for city council, and he ran for city council for only one reason. He was going to get on city council and introduce a motion to start a university. So he ran, he was elected, waited about a month or so, and at that point, he made his motion. There was some debate, some argument about improper um, introduction of motions, whatever, but he prevailed, his motion carried, and the city allowed the beginning of instructional classes under the name uh, for a brief time as the McMicken University, but eventually the University of Cincinnati. Those first classes, and we'll see in a little bit, involved um, uh, some drawing and design classes. But from that moment on, Cornelius Camagus was tied to the University of Cincinnati. He served 
on the university board for a quarter of a century. In fact, he died in office as chair of the university board. And he was a very hands-on director. It was he who prevailed upon the university to start offering classes in Spanish, and he was very instrumental in attracting what uh, the pieces of what became the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Now, as I mentioned, the first classes that were actually offered by the university uh, were in drawing and design. And for 15 years, the design program, or the design department, was part of the University of Cincinnati until Nicholas Longworth came up with some money that enabled that department to split off from the university and join up with the newly formed art museum uh, to create the Art Academy of Cincinnati. So the Art Academy today is the remnants of the very first classes that were offered at the University of Cincinnati. While that design department was still associated with the university, there were some outstanding professors, including this one, Ben Pittman, who uh, is represented very well in the Cincinnati wing of the art museum with the marvelous wood carvings that he and his students uh, produced. And Pittman, in addition to being a, a, a wonderful craftsperson, uh, was also uh, interested in a variety of other things. He created, for instance, his own shorthand system. Uh, so the Pittman system that you see around was started by this guy in Cincinnati. University of Cincinnati classes finally opened in September 1873 at Woodward High School. This is not the Woodward High School building that exists today. This is the old Woodward High School building that was on essentially the same piece of property there on Upper Broadway. There were more than 150 applicants uh, for the very first class, but only 58 were accepted uh, for admission to the University of Cincinnati in response to this initial piece of advertising for the university, this invitational flyer uh, to sign up for classes. Of the 58 applicants, um, there were 40 women, 18 men, five instructors, all drawn from the existing Woodward faculty. And for that first year, the classes that were offered were chemistry, natural philosophy, Latin, Greek, French, and German. Overseeing the faculty was George Harper, who happened to be the principal of Woodward High School at the time. And because of that, he's generally recognized as the first actual president of the actual University of Cincinnati. The next year, classes moved from Woodward <coughs> to the nearby Third Intermediate School. And there, the students faced real university professors who had been recruited from the East with invitations to take part in the uh, founding of a new university and, for the time, um, very high-priced salaries. Among them was Henry Turner Eddy, who would serve several terms as dean beginning that particular year. But it was the third academic year before the University of Cincinnati actually moved into its new home. And this is um, the university's original location on the hillside uh, above McMicken Avenue at the top of Elm Street. The um, building in the background there is the university building, which was originally intended as a single wing of what would be a much larger university building that was never built. The building in the foreground is the uh, actual house of Charles McMicken, which remained on the university grounds. In 19, or 1877, the directors abolished this rotating position of dean of faculty 
and they selected Thomas Vickers to serve as the chief administrative and chief academic officers. The directors couldn't agree that what they really wanted was a president, and so they gave Vickers <coughs> the title of uh, rector. It's the only rector we have had in the university's history. Vickers was, at the time of his appointment, the librarian for the public library in Cincinnati. And initially, he served as the rector of the new university without pay. As he was being selected, Cornelius Comages was affronted because Vickers was clearly electioneering for this position. He wanted this job. He wanted it bad. He was going around to all the directors, pleading his case. So Comages um, mounted a com competing campaign for another director, a guy named Julius Dexter, who has a marvelous mausoleum in Spring Grove, if you're ever there. Um, and it turns out that uh, Vickers was elected uh, winning nine votes, Dexter only got three votes. The chairman of the board, a man named George Hoadley, predicted that Vickers would be of great assistance in securing harmony in instruction and discipline, if only. Vickers was controversial from the start. He was a very liberal pastor, of the First Unitarian Church in Cincinnati. He had sparked outrage when he invited rabbis to speak from his <coughs> pulpit. He had launched a, uh, an infamous campaign against the reading of the Bible in Cincinnati's public schools. As a librarian, he attempted to undo the cataloging <coughs> system introduced by his predecessor and he began a recataloging process that was never completed. It was sort of a primitive way to get tenure because as long as he did not complete the cataloging process, he couldn't be replaced because nobody knew what his cataloging process was all about. So it kept him in job security. At the university, he was alleged to have hired cronies to fill faculty positions he enraged the students and alienated the city's high schools. After he departed from the university, he spent a decade trying to divorce his wife, scandalizing Cincinnati, North Dakota, and several other states where he was making the effort. The Cincinnati Inquirer described him as a man surrounded with a pestilential odor of quarrelsomeness. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, under Vickers, the university began to look and operate something like an actual university. It had multiple departments. They celebrated their the first commencements, and some faculty, uh, notably Henry Eddy, began publishing papers about their research. And the city gave an entire research unit, the Cincinnati Observatory, to the university to take care of as part of its portfolio. Still, the university needed adult supervision, and it found it in Jacob Dolson Cox. Cox um, was the first person named president of the university. He was a decorated Civil War veteran. He had already been governor of the state of Ohio. He was a congressman. He was currently serving and continued to serve throughout his time at UC as the dean of the Cincinnati Law School. And he was the father of eight children, which prepared him for a lot of what he ran into. Cox brought a calming influence to the university. Um, he awarded UC's first doctoral degree, witnessed the birth of the university's athletics programs, and he failed only in his attempt to once again consolidate all the educational trusts in the city, even though he was willing 
to bring the Catholics in. Cox led the university through a potentially fatal crisis in 1885 when the college building was gutted by fire uh, one evening. The very day that uh, it was reported that the, uh, the college building was severely damaged, Isaac Wise, who was the president of Hebrew Union College, offered the use of his college's classrooms until the UC building could be re restored. And so for the next year, university classes were held at Hebrew Union College, which at that time was located downtown on West 6th Street. Although Cox was almost unanimously acclaimed as a successful academic leader, he found himself incapable of managing two academic institutions simultaneously, and so he returned full-time to his position at the Cincinnati uh, Law School and remained dean of that law school for another eight years. Throughout his presidency, Cox had been trying to find a better location for the university, and it had nothing to do with the fire. The university building down there on McMicken Avenue, you can still see the hillside today. It's a very steep, rubbly, rocky hillside. It was totally unsuited for anything that might resemble a college campus. No, uh, no playing fields, for one thing, which the students complained about regularly. Uh, no gardens, no, um, no quadrangles, just uh, hillside and steps. A few months after Cox's resignation, the city acted on one of his recommendations and set aside 43 acres of Burnett Woods for the university's use. And that sent the city, the university, and McMicken's heirs back to court for another five years. The heirs claimed that the city had violated the will by removing or suggesting to remove the university from the McMicken estate, which was clearly called for in the will. In the court filings, none of the heirs mentioned the elephant in the room. The reason they wanted the um, university held accountable for this decision, they had nothing to do with where the university was located. It was just that if they could prove that the university had violated the will, the bequest was void, and it would return to them. So all the, um, the fighting took place with the usual rancor throughout the city, and eventually the heirs lost, the city won, and the university moved uh, to its current location. Throughout the 1890s, while all this was going on, the University of Cincinnati had no president again. The chief academic officer position, sort of the provost of today, rotated through the faculty. And so we, uh, we can refer to this as a period of minor presidents. Uh, if you're keeping score, um, Edward Willis Hyde and Henry Turner Eddy both had about four years, Waylon Benedict uh, two years, William Oliver Spruill, a single year, and Philip Van Ness Myers, and they just don't make names like this anymore, uh, had a single year. And the problem at this time was this. If everybody's in charge, no one's in charge. And so the members of the board publicly complained that the faculty were cons continually sending uh, with annoying frequency, statements denouncing other faculty members. According to one board member, if all suggestions of removal had been acted upon, not a single member of the present teaching body would have been left. So, although for a decade led by these minor and complaining presidents, the university continued to progress. In 1893, the university changed its calendar 
from the quarter system to the semester system. <laughs> Several of the city's health-related colleges lent their name to the university, although these associations were in name only. The colleges retained separate boards, separate budgets, and primarily used the university for prestige and for advertising purposes. But eventually, almost all of them sought closer relations with the university. There was a serious effort to merge the Cincinnati Law School and with it, the endowments of the Cincinnati College, uh, which the university lacked. In 1891, that got as far as Ohio legislation trying to enforce this merger, but it dissolved again in lawsuits and tears. So the university created its own law department in 1896. That prompted a new round of merger talks in a reorganized College of Law incorporating the Cincinnati Law School and the UC Law Department, which opened classes in 1897 with a new dean, William Howard Taft. Taft was drafted by the board of directors as a headhunter to go out and find a real president for the University of Cincinnati. And with the assistance of one of the university's directors, he went and visited Princeton, Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. But it was at the University of Missouri that he found Howard Ayers, or as he might be known, the son of the return of Thomas Vickers II. Ayer's first act as president of the university was to ask a substantial number of the faculty to resign immediately. The controversy set the tone for the rest of his administration. For the next five tumultuous years, um, Ayers was constantly in the headlines. He took aim at the medical department of the university, asserting his right to appoint professors without approval from the existing faculty. The dispute raged for months, with Ayers at one point standing on the steps of the medical department, shouting, I propose to govern the medical department of the University of Cincinnati if I have to go through hell to do it, and you gentlemen may as well understand it now as later. There were rumblings in the press that Ayers was a closet agnostic. <laughs> no doubt contributing to his troubles, Ayers was a humdrum speaker. On the dedication of the new law school building, Ayers droned on and on while the featured speaker, a noted scholar, began, as the newspaper said, to nod his legal head in slumber. <laughs> from which he was aroused only by the applause as Ayers concluded. In 1903, a newly revised board of directors took office. For a number of complex reasons involving lawsuits, Ohio revised the governance of municipalities, including municipal universities. And so university board appointments, which up until that point had been made by the Superior Court were now made by the mayor. The mayor installed a new board of directors made up of alumni whose favorite professors had been fired by Howard Ayers. <laughs> Within weeks of their taking office, they asked Ayers to resign. Ayers accepted the insistent declaration with his usual good charm and refused to budge at one point locking himself in his office. The matter dragged on for, uh, for a year, and in April 1904, Ayers is recorded in the minutes of the board of directors uh, shouting, I want to denounce this action as an outrage. Every one of you men knows in your heart that it is an outrage. If anything has gone wrong at the university in the last year for which I am 
To blame, I would like to know it. This action, I repeat, is an outrage. Eventually, he capitulated and submitted his resignation in June. Now, the Ayers administration was not without its successes. It was Ayers who started evening classes in 1902. He initiated the discussions that eventually led to the creation of the College of Business. He appointed the first dean of women. And it was pretty much acknowledged that he had, in fact, improved the level of teaching within the university. So the board had gone east and, and west to find President Ayers, and it went south to find the next leader of the university. Following a brief uh, interregnum led by Dr. Joseph Harry, the board announced the appointment of Charles W. Dabney, who at that time was president of the University of Tennessee. Dabney's 16-year term, in comparison to his predecessor, was a golden age for the University of Cincinnati. Before agreeing to take the job in Cincinnati, Dabney went to an over-the-Rhine bar to meet with George Cox, known as the boss of Cincinnati. Told Cox that if he accepted this position, he wanted no political uh, interference, and Cox agreed that if Dabney took the position, he would leave politics out of any decisions governing the University of Cincinnati. And history indicates that, by and large, Cox kept his word. Under Dabney, the university opened colleges of engineering, education, commerce, home ec, nursing, and graduate studies. The university enjoyed popular and financial support from the citizens of Cincinnati. And perhaps the greatest measure of Dabney's success occurred in 1972 when the Carnegie Commission, studying the state of higher education in America, reported that the University of Cincinnati was one of the few American universities that are not only of but for their cities. And this was word for word the description that Dabney used in his pronouncements about the university in 1912, 60 years earlier. Dabney continuously refined this notion of the municipal university. Sometimes he was courting controversy with his insistence that universities be intimately wedded to the life of their cities. Cooperative education, which was founded under the Dabney administration, is perhaps the best example. Herman Schneider, you'll remember, tried to start co-op at a number of institutions before he arrived in Cincinnati and found the welcoming environment created by, by Charles Dabney. Historian Daniel Beaver wrote that Dandy was the first president to articulate a new relationship among the urban community, business leadership, and higher education. Characteristic of many of the progressives of his day, he believed it the duty of a university to serve the needs of the local community, to take a lead in the intellectual, political, industrial, and social life of Cincinnati. Through his University of the City, Beaver said, Dabney attempted to persuade the community that the best financial investment it might make was one that provided locally educated scientific experts, technicians, business leaders, teachers, engineers, scholars, and doctors. And believe it or not, this was considered a controversial position at the time. After serving as UC's president for 16 years, Dabney submitted his resignation in 1920 as he approached the mandatory retirement age of 65. He had been adept at distancing the university from city government while still fulfilling the municipal responsibilities of his institution. 
With his retirement, however, the university's affairs were thrown into the arena of public debate. Some campus and Cincinnati groups wanted William Howard Taft to step in as the president, figuring that as a UC uh, alumnus and former president, he would generate community support for a new endowment campaign. Others clamored for the presidency to be offered to Herman Schneider, enjoying success with his co-op program. But in the middle of this discussion, while the board of directors was at least publicly neutral, a very respected professor of economics named Frederick Hicks lamented that he was underpaid and submitted his resignation. Hicks was indeed a valuable member of the university, and so in a surprise announcement in May of 1920, Hicks rescinded his resignation, accepted a much larger paycheck, and accepted the position of interim president. The board made this arrangement permanent in September of 1920. Hicks proved himself equal to the task of guiding the university throughout his decade. When he retired eight years later, student enrollment had tripled from 3,000 to more than 9,500. A series of buildings were constructed on campus, including the Memorial Dormitory, now part of the CCM complex, Nippert Stadium, Swift Hall, Taft Hall, the Tanner's Laboratory. More importantly, Hicks continued in the path of Dabney to maintain the university's growth in scholarship. Among his administrative innovations, Hicks created an office of public relations and alumni affairs. Throughout the Hicks presidency, Dean Herman Schneider was earning a hot reputation over in Baldwin Hall. His co-op plan was the co-op plan was lighting a fire under American education. The trustees retreated to a smoke-filled room and agreed that they wanted the engineering dean for president. Throughout the uh, uh, Schneider uh, presidency, which began in 1928, um, Schneider cemented his reputation as one of the finest philosophers of education in the United States. Unfortunately, uh, his, his uh, plans for higher education were often far more complicated than could be actually enacted in reality. He was not above a little conniving and, and a few palace revolts, uh, but his love and primary allegiance were to the College of Engineering, which he considered his own private empire. What was good for the College of Engineering, he believed, was good for the University of Cincinnati. As president, he proposed a plan for the university uh, where all of the disciplines throughout campus were divided up with their own little quadrangles even had postcards printed to show what it would look like, but it was never built. Um, and presented a well-reasoned and rather windy uh, report on his thoughts on higher education to the Board of Directors in 1929. In that presentation, he drew from the facts and activities of mankind's existence and success over the millennia to determine a strategic plan for the university. The university, he said, should contain five divisions, a liberal arts division, which was pre-professional, the economic division covering the manufacture and distribution of things, the human adjustments division, which was basically the graduate school, the physical and mental health division uh, for the medical program, uh, as well as sports and other extra extracurricular activities in the fine arts division. Everything in this curriculum should lead to physical and mental enlightenment. Schneider said, lest anyone miss the point, he used 
As an example, the outcomes from the College of Engineering. The proposal was approved, but the board took no further action, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence that the plan was put into place in any way, shape, or form at the university. Perhaps the most noteworthy uh, evidence of Schneider's presidency here is the Blagan Library, which was built and dedicated to replace the old Van Wormer Library, now the administration building uh, up on Clifton Avenue. Schneider also created the Basic Science Laboratory. This was, this was sort of a, uh, a scientific think tank in which researchers were allowed to follow any path of inquiry uh, they wanted to as long as they could demonstrate some benefit to humanity. Yeah, it's a wacky looking group, isn't it? Uh, from their discoveries came the sun lamp, the use of ultraviolet light to preserve foods, preparation age, and frozen orange juice concentrate. Because of this laboratory, the University of Cincinnati became known as a pioneer in uh, pa patenting discoveries in university laboratories for commercial purposes. <coughs> Schneider never wanted to be president, and he wanted to end his career back in the dean's office, and so he submitted his resignation after just four years. There were some health concerns as well. And in January of that year, he happened to bump into a 46-year-old dean from Swarthmore College who was in Cincinnati to address the Association of American Universities. His name was Raymond Walters, and his speech so impressed Schneider that Schneider gave him a tour of the campus, passed his name on to the board of directors. After a whirlwind courtship, Walters was named UC's next president in March of 1932. From the very first day he walked into his office, Walters had to confront the realities of the Great Depression. Enrollment fell, revenues dropped, Walters was faced with very difficult decisions to keep the university from foundering. He cut salaries, dismissed staff and faculty. In October of 1932, every university employee took a 10% pay cut, and in, in October of the next year, every employee received a pay cut from between 10 to 32%. In the face of these diminished salaries, many faculty took on outside work uh, in New Deal programs. One sociology professor uh, worked as the supervisor of a WPA project at the Art Museum overseeing the construction of exhibit space. But even so, the university found ways to chip in and help those who were having it harder than them. Uh, the proceeds from the annual UC Miami football game were donated to unemployment relief and many departments at the university played important roles in the recovery after the Great Flood of 1937. During World War II, the University of Cincinnati was catapulted into the elevated ranks of research institutions. Federal funds flowed into the campus for a variety of projects. I'd mentioned uh, earlier on the Tanner's Laboratory, which did a lot of the research on producing leather that would stand up to the demands of war in the uh, Pacific Theater. Um, there were a number of medical um, programs that, that created field hospitals uh, during the war. Uh, a lot of war-related research in disease control, uh, environmental fitness, ma uh, ma machinery production. The university totally revamped its curriculum to prepare um, uh, graduates for work uh, in wartime efforts. And it was during the war years that a very important medical discovery was made at UC when George Rivischel, a faculty member in the chemical engineering department, formulated the first commercially available antihistamine, Benadryl. After the war, veterans supported by the GI Bill marched onto campus swelling the Vetsville barracks uh, on the quadrangles. You can see that there were these army surplus barracks 
everywhere on campus to take care of the increased enrollment. By the mid-1950s, the enrollment trend had settled into a normal pattern of going up, up, up. This chart uh, produced in 1960 predicts that by 1970, enrollment would be 25,000. When 1970 arrived, enrollment was already topping 30,000. You see extended its research reputation globally, gaining fame at this time for the archaeological uh, excavations of Carl Blagan at Troy. Uh, Raymond Walters himself contributed to the university's scholarly role by publishing the annual School and Society Report, uh, a statistical breakdown of enrollments throughout uh, America's colleges and universities. Universities' diversity during this period increased to the point where African American students who were essentially barred from participation in most of the activities of the student body had sufficient numbers to create their own organizations and have a dramatic impact on the campus. Like Presidents Dabney and Hicks, Walters remained in office until he reached the university's mandatory retirement age and he handed off to Walter Consuelo Langsam a vibrant modern municipal university with very bright prospects. The year after Langsam became president, UC marked the 50th anniversary of cooperative education with a three-day whirl of symposia, honorary degrees, building dedications, and a week-long exhibit at the brand new Armory Fieldhouse. Thousands of Cincinnatians showed up on campus to march through to the displays that were highlighting the successes of the University of Cincinnati and the industrial concerns within Cincinnati. And it was clear from this uh, exhibit that the university was poised for progress. The Langsam years set the template in many ways for today's University of Cincinnati. Uh, he was um, a dynamo of unceasing change. He even changed the university calendar, getting rid of semesters and starting a quarter system. Growth was constant throughout the Langsam years. In 1956, 13,820 students enrolled at the university, and more than half, about 7,000, attended evening programs. By 1971, the university counted 34,742 students, with about 7,000 still in the evening program. Langsam's first budget was a little over $10 million. His final budget topped $100 million. The faculty swelled from about 350 to 2,800. Langsam added four colleges and three branch campuses. General Hospital was transferred to university administration. The university launched public radio station WGUC and the core campus expanded eastward into the old Quarryville neighborhoods and northwards into Burnett Woods. Langsam was inaugurated into what was then known as a streetcar college where the dean's wife still served tea on white-gloved afternoons and he retired from an administration building that had just recently been occupied by the students for the Dem uh, Democratic Society. Throughout his entire administration, Langsam maintained a tradition of senior suppers. Every single student on achieving senior year received an invitation to dine with Mr. and Mrs. Langsam at their home on Clifton Avenue, and many accepted even when the senior class enrollment had topped 4,000 students. In the fall of 1970, in Wilson Auditorium, a psychology professor looked out at the new freshman class and said facetiously, I'd like each of you to stand up and tell me a little bit about yourselves. <laughs> Newsweek Magazine 
at this time was examining the phenomenon known as the megaversity. And by any measure, that's what the University of Cincinnati had become by the 1970s. There was a sprawling physical plant that had nearly tripled in size over the past decade, straining to accommodate an ever-increasing enrollment of students. And this new model university needed a new model president, and UC turned to Warren Bennis. There's no question that this new president was recruited as a change agent. And years later, Bennis reflected on the lessons he learned in his time at UC. He said specifically, I arrived at the University of Cincinnati with a mandate to transform the university from a local institution to a state institution, a goal that was by no means widely shared among the faculty, or for that matter, the citizens of Cincinnati. One longtime university board member warned me to keep a low profile until I had a better grasp of the conservative community and the people in it were more comfortable with me. I chose to ignore his wise counsel. There's no question that Bennis was a different kind of president. He hosted a weekly television show called Bennis, with an exclamation point. <laughs> He often got up with an idea at 3 a.m. and called together his cabinet for meetings that lasted all day. Bennis wrote pamphlets, white papers, and booklets with almost blog-like frequency about his thinking on the modern university. He certainly opened up the university to the community and encouraged wide participation in university decisions. Like many change agents, he discovered that there were more people interested in the idea of change than the reality of change. Later, Bennis would say, I learned that I wanted to think and write about leadership more than I wanted to run an organization while I was at UC. Bennis also commented that he learned crisis management at the University of Cincinnati, and his crises ranged from a professor who decided that uh, he was going to conduct daycare in his own office uh, at the college to a federal investigation of whole body radiation experiments at the university's general hospital. Largely due to Bennis's decisions, uh, UC's faculty unionized. The medical center assumed a larger and more powerful role in university affairs. Budgetary woes dogged the university throughout the early 1970. But for Bennis, the top priority, the reason he was brought to UC, was gaining UC's entrance into the state system of higher education. And in this, he succeeded. His success gave him his exit strategy. As a state university, the old city university board would be reconstituted, and a new board, Bennis said, should pick its own president. And the new board did so, tapping an alumnus, Henry R. Winkler. <laughs> when Winkler was named executive vice president of the university in 1977, that appointment marked his return to the institution where he received his bachelor degree in 1938, his master's degree in 1940. And in December of 1977, at the age of 61, Winkler was selected as UC's 23rd president. He remains the only alumnus to hold that chief executive office. Now where Bennis was clearly recruited to change the University of Cincinnati, Winkler was selected for his calming influence and his reputation as a scholar. Looking back on his presidency in 1984, Winkler agreed with that appraisal. I'd like to say, he said, that I brought stability to an institution that was dramatically and significantly unstable, that I kept before it a vision of academic quality, while at the same time being concerned with access to a broad spectrum of our students. I would like to say that I left UC substantially better administered than when I found it. Winkler was especially proud of his efforts to raise funds for endowed faculty chairs. Succeeding Winkler was Joseph Steger. During his term as president, Steger brought the university into the digital age. 
weaving the internet into the university's academic programs. He identified four key strategies for the University of Cincinnati in an influential document known as Harnessing the Intellect. These strategies were globalization, technology, pedagogy, and interdisciplinarity. Steger created a one and a half million dollar fund to help faculty adapt to the new technology then being used in learning. He initiated the International Co-op Program, signed affiliation agreements with 50 universities from China to France, introduced academic requirements for mathematics, language, and cultural studies. Most importantly, Steger oversaw the rebirth of the university's campus with new academic and research buildings designed by world-renowned architects, guided by a master plan launched in the early 1990s. He was particularly interested in the new park-like green spaces throughout campus. Calling on the university to operate more like a private institution, Steger worked to increase fundraising from $15 million annually to more than $73 million annually. His efforts increased the university's endowment from about $150 million uh, to nearly $1 billion. During his administration, research financing quadrupled uh, to more than $260 million, and the university's National Science Foundation research ranking climbed from 76th in the United States to 47th. Steger involved the university as the tri-state's largest employer in a number of initiatives aimed at improving the quality of life within the city of Cincinnati itself including the Smale Commission to study Cincinnati's infrastructure, the Binger Commission to reform the Cincinnati Public Schools, and the Metropolitan Growth Alliance, um, as well as the redevelopment corporations in the neighborhoods surrounding the campus. When he retired, Steger had been president for 19 years, longer than any UC president except Raymond Walters. During the quest for the next University of Cincinnati president, a member of the search committee, emerged from an interview with the candidate with one word on his lips. Wow. The candidate was Nancy Zimfer. Committee Chair Jeff Weiler told the Cincinnati Post that wow was an apt appraisal. The way she handled some very difficult questions in our interviews was so very impressive. We had some really fine people interested in the job that Nancy stood out. During her five years as president, Zimper got a lot of wows. She got a lot of catcalls as well. A change agent, much like Venice, Zimper won fans as well as detractors. She took steps to link the university to the public school system, to create better pathways for transfer students, to dig out from a substantial budget deficit, to raise academic standards. <laughs> She also dismissed the winningest coach in university history. When Zimfer left for New York to become the chancellor of that state's higher education system, it was widely acknowledged that she had done much to improve UC's academic reputation. And now as the university marches into the future, it enjoys a strong and growing reputation that would have amazed the citizens of 1870. The year 2010 was particularly rewarding as all of these accomplishments came to light, with U.S. News describing UC as one of 15 up-and-coming universities, the Chronicle calling us a research heavyweight, Forbes announcing that we were one of the world's 15 most beautiful campuses, the only green university in Ohio, according to the Princeton Review, a military-friendly campus by GI Jobs magazine, finally, after many years, reaching the top tier of America's best colleges in the U.S. news rankings, and the Times of London announcing that UC was among the top 200 universities in the world. The University of Cincinnati, in short, had become that university the citizens of Cincinnati had asked for in 1870. Thank you.